So good afternoon to everybody and uh, welcome to you all to today's online seminar organized by the Florence School of Banking and Finance on the topic SSM supervisory measure in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Elena Carletti. I'm a professor of finance at Bocconi University and I will be chairing this webinar today. So I want to start by welcoming all our speakers in alphabetic order. We have Thorsten Beck, who is a professor of banking and finance at the CAS Business School, but he is also a member of the Advisory Scientific Committee of the European Systemic Risk Board and at the moment very involved in the policy debate. Then we have Eduard Fernandez Bollo, who is a member of the Supervisory Board of the European Central Bank. And then last we have Till Schurman, who is a partner and co-head of Oliver Wyman Risk and Public Policy Practice in the Americas. So given also the time zone difference, we would particularly like to thank all of you, but in particular Till, given that he's up very early in the morning to be with us today. So the topic of today's seminar will be discussing the recent supervisory measure adopted by the SSM and in particular the rationale behind them, why they have been adopted and what is the desired outcome of these measures, as well as the ongoing development and the open issues. So in terms of organization, we will start with Eduard and we will give him the floor for 15 minutes. In his position, he will give us an overview of the measures that the SSM has adopted as well as the open issues that he sees that are still on the table. And then we will have Torsten and Till, each with the seven minutes, that will sort of discuss Eduard's uh, intervention, and then we will open up the floor. So the participants are very welcome to ask questions, and please use the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of your screen. And you can pose questions during the entire webinar, so please don't wait for the speakers to finish their first intervention. I will then collect them and pose the question to the speakers. Please ask a brief question, and if you like, write the name of the person you would like the question to be addressed. So without further ado, let me thank again Eduardo for being with us today, and please, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Elena, and uh, thanks for this occasion uh, given by the, the Institute and the Foreign School of Banking uh, to explain and discuss the measures that we are taking as uh, ECB supervision in the context of this crisis. Uh, I, I really do welcome it because uh, I think that always in supervision, but especially in the very particular circumstances where we are today, it is a part of the effectiveness of supervision that it is understood, uh, that it is transparent and understood by uh, the, the stakeholders, uh, whatever they are, of course, the banking industry, but also are the public in general, that uh, they, they can see what is uh, the, the sense and the presence of the supervisor in circumstances as a, uh, where it is such an important one uh, like this. And I will just uh, start by uh, repeating uh, the obvious, but uh, that I think uh, should be the background to all what we say. Um, we are here now in a situation that is uh, a clear case of an exogenous shock to the banking system, uh, a shock that came from uh, the outside. And in, in this, this is markedly different to what I had, uh, unfortunately, experienced also uh, uh, more than 10 years ago uh, when uh, I was uh, the French supervisor of an endogenous shock uh, for, from the uh, financial system, even if it was already in part America, but here, well, essentially, um, the internal working out of the financial system. Here we have, I will say, clearly, a more clear cut, it's difficult, a shock that comes from outside. So it has something that is good. Something that is good is that uh, it does not reveal in itself internal fragilities built up in the banking system. In fact, uh, thanks to the repair that has been done uh, for a long time uh, since the last crisis, the starting point of the banking system is much, much better than the one that we had in, um, also uh, in the last crisis. Uh, we, we were able to uh, we are able to start from a position at the end of uh, December 2019 uh, that are 
in capital, in liquidity buffers are much, much higher than they were, we say, in 2007. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. The thing that, of course, is uh, less uh, positive is that uh, uh, the, uh, this shock comes from outside and it's such a novel shock in its ways of propagating and diffusing to the uh, financial system that uh, we need to do something new. Uh, we, we don't, cannot use exactly uh, the instruments and the experience that we have developed in, in dealing with past crises of the financial system. So uh, that's why what uh, uh, the overarching, I will say, principle that are behind all the measures I will try to go through now is that we wanted to be as fast as possible admitting that as everybody, I mean, until February, it was difficult to assess the magnitude of the thing. Had to go, uh, starting in March, to, be, uh, to try to go as soon as possible, but also to uh, make room for the uncertainty that we don't know, and I will come back at the end of that, we don't know exactly how it will uh, continue to uh, So what we tried to do, uh, I hope it's working, uh, <laughs> right, um, was first to uh, do as prompt as possible, of course, balancing opposition, which is always supervisory position, so normally, I would say, more risk averse than the ones of the banks, a, a balanced position in face of the new risk that was adapted to the quality of it. And again, this is why I think it's even more important in this, uh, it is what I should Clearly admit is learning by doing in this crisis to be transparent and to be understood by the outside world what we are doing. So we uh, we started really uh, pretty soon, I think, in the 12th of March, with this general line that was: let's use the, the parts of the regulation that are made that were designed used as buffers, as uh, counter-cyclical parts in the toolkit of supervision and regulation that was made after, uh, after the last one. So the, one of the first things that we did, and first time we did that, is uh, to declare openly that we think the bank can fully use all the capital and liquidity buffers, including the one that is more idiosyncratic, that or a supervisory one, like as we call the pillar two guidance, the buffer that is uh, upon all the other buffers, and that is uh, what we more closely follow from a supervisory point of view because it's the first to begin. So we uh, we said use the buffers as they are, and we said clearly, for instance, that the liquidity coverage ratio. Because we had some question. This is a regulation. And this is not a supervisory buffer. It was meant to be a buffer. Uh, we have repeated that the, we could go for a situation, and I think it, it's the right use that we could make. Uh, we could go for situations where the bank do use the buffer, that is, they are technically in reach of the regulation. But this is something that, as supervisor, we will take into account, and we think it's normal be able to do it in this uh, Again, let me underline, this is the first time we've said that. that uh, uh, there is a regulation that can be used. That we, are, we, we look at it as a normal part of the budget. A second point, maybe less uh, um, innovative from a conceptual point of view, but um, who has had a, an important impact is we had a change in the pillar two competition that was meant for uh, the next year, and we wrote it forward, that had the, the advantage of being immediate, uh, really. They could meet uh, the uh, pillar two requirements with uh, new elements, uh, and in particularly additional tier one or tier two instruments. And we have been seeing, maybe we'll come back to that, but there has been issues. So we are in a situation where we can have reinforcement of the 
funds, even after the crisis of It's also something that comes to value. And then we begun, we'll see that we will do more later, uh, to try to adapt our operational charge on the banks. Here, there, I think this is maybe the first time the ECB has uh, to say publicly that uh, we were postponing supervisory action and we were postponing to alleviate the operational burden on the bank. Here, again, it was tried to be very uh, faithful, it's not the, uh, will not be the appropriate term, but to, uh, to respond to what we see the very operational nature of the challenges that the bank faced. Like uh, most of us, in fact, uh, they had to adapt to different ways of operate, operating, operating at a distance, much less physically. So we needed to give them also room from a supervisory space, uh, room to adapt. So we suspended some supervisory actions uh, that the uh, purpose of that was to give them also operational room to adapt to the new so that was our first reaction uh, in the press release of the 20th March. Uh, here, by the way, you will find uh, links huh, to all the documents of this. Um, uh, so here we listened. That was one week afterwards because we had listened to the banking industry. And we realized that there were uh, three points uh, that came out from this interaction that were very important. First, uh, our initiative on NPL, on the non-performing loans. Uh, and here we said that clearly that we will be able, this was our initiative, uh, the specific ECB action of the last three years on uh, having targets for reducing the NPLs, and that we were ready to adapt. We had these plans in another context. We are not abandoning this structure, not at all, but we are ready to adapt and we engage immediately with the banks in what were the necessary. And what was more innovative, I will say, is that we had a lot of questions relating to the application of the IFRS, especially, of course, IFRS. Here, I will say this is uh, one of the examples. We did not stop from going, I will say, to the limit of our role as supervisor, because this is an accounting a standard for which we are not the company uh, the standard setter, uh, we are not uh, even an accounting authority, uh, but of course accounting is essential framework and we then in a cooperative way with, uh, and it was seen with EBA, with uh, IFRS, uh, we promoted the flexible use of uh, this, uh, these standards. First on the part that was directly on our remit, which is uh, ability to use the transitional arrangements of the capital requirement regulations. And second, something that again was very important was the limit of our remit, which is uh, to really encourage the banks to give greater weight to the long-term outlook in uh, when they will have to estimate the long-term expected uh, credit. We had a we refined this guidance in a letter to the CEOs where, uh, for instance, we uh, advise them to uh, take a look for the scenarios, for instance, the scenarios of the ECB, the ECB not the supervisory part, but the macroeconomic scenarios of the ECB. But uh, what was, I would say, the supervisory value added is to uh, insist on this idea that in balancing the immediate information and the forward-looking outlook, we thought it would be, and let me underline that, even from a supervisory and risk management view, uh, it will be the appropriate thing to, uh, to give a greater weight than was given in the past to the outlook, uh, because this is, for us, one of the ways to avoid an uh, the excessive volatility that can come from purely short-term. We will come, maybe come back to that. If, uh, then we came to another point where we went to, we, we didn't 
we're not shy in going to the limits of our remedy. This is when we uh, uh, made this recommendation not to bring it in 2019 and to the, not to do that in 2020, and also to refrain from fair buybacks until at least October of this year. Why? It was also unprecedented. Never that. But for us, it was the adequate response of, to the sheer enormous amount of uncertainty that came upon the accounts of the bank in this year and the next. And for us, it was really the sound and prudent way to manage this uncertainty was to gain uh, on funds, and I will say, especially that's why it's in the British and Portuguese song, uh, given the also unprecedented amount of, uh, um, I will say, public, direct, and indirect support that the banks were received. And in particular, the fact that. Uh, we were relaxing uh, also our supervisory standards. So, well, this was more technical again, but this uh, uh, this came out for, uh, from the constant interaction with the banking industry. Uh, we uh, saw the results of, uh, of course, what was the, the application of the capital framework for market risk, and we thought that given the um, extraordinary levels of volatility that uh, were in the financial markets since the outbreak of coronavirus crisis, in fact, uh, potentially since uh, the beginning of March, uh, that uh, we needed to compensate that, that would be reflected by uh, the possibility to reduce temporarily another part of the risk and then we went to more, I would say, matters that uh, were more clearly in uh, supervisory day-to-day -day, uh, life. Uh, we prolonged the first operational relief we had made at the beginning of March by completely um, revising the supervisory actions calendar, essentially, uh, with, uh, in contact with EBA, we suppressed the stress test that was uh, meant for this year, and we have completely redrawn the, uh, the, the yearly examination program that we have, uh, the supervisory review the examination program that we performed this year, in order to adapt it to exactly what are the circumstances. So we put into brackets the normal breath methodology and we devoted all our supervisory energies and then also for the bank to try to follow up uh, to the follow-up of the, uh, the crisis. Um, we'll, uh, we, can, we decline it also for all kinds of supervisory decisions. I will be happy to give more details if you're interested, but I would like to finish uh, in time with uh, saying that our preliminary approach is that this has had an effort. Uh, we will have uh, the relief in capital that we have had for to absorb the losses amounts to more or less 100 billion, which is a lot. And uh, to give you, if you see even more impressive, if you see, uh, this allows, we could allow uh, for 1.8 trillion of uh, addition to the, uh, to the capital. So that's what we did. Uh, second point, a recommendation on dividend distribution. Uh, this has resulted in uh, something like 25 billion, or more or less, that has not been planned for this and has not. Again, this is very significant in having added to the capacity of the banks uh, to continue. And, 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 and then, of course, we, uh, we think that uh, the other operational relief, uh, uh, the SREP and the uh, stress relief, while we cannot give you a figure, 
has been significant in uh, uh, helping the banks to redirect the risk framework and the, and the risk controls to the way that is converging. So now where we are? Where we are? First, of course, we are also following what are uh, the, can be maybe the, the some small adjustments to the regulatory framework that are now uh, discussed at the level one in Europe. Uh, there's a project by the Commission to amend the pair, and of course, we are fully prepared to uh, implement this as soon as possible. There's an urgent procedure, and I think if the legislators uh, are able to do it soon, we will be completely ready to implement that also extremely soon. So even this, uh, the, this summer, the end of this summer, is the uh, regular text are finalized in this. The second point is that we are also extremely sensible to the fact that we still don't know how this will be. So we are prepared to all the hypotheses. The first thing is that uh, uh, we all the measures that we've done, for instance, were essentially, when we say the temporary operational relief, we need for six months. For six months, it was made for six months because we needed the six months to be able to appraise it. But we are ready, if it's necessary, both to extend the length of this measure, but also, even if we don't extend it, which I will say will be almost a more optimistic situation, I think that everything is going back to normal, uh, if we don't extend it, to allow for a, re a path to return to normal that is conducive to a smooth return. Everything that has been suspended will be either prolonged or if it's not prolonged, we'll have uh, ways out of it that, uh, where we will take due account and there we will go back, in, of course, to the case-by-case -case approach. And of course, we are also trying to prepare, to make preparations for all possible situations, all possible solutions to the financial system. And we will be ready for that. Okay. Thank you very much, Eduard. Unfortunately, the connection is not uh, super perfect. I know this is not depending on you, but in case you can do something to improve the audio from your side, okay. it would be highly appreciated. I know these things, unfortunately, are out of control, but uh, in case you can do something. And thank you for this very interesting overview of the supervisory measure. And I have already lots of questions, both from myself and the Q&A box, and we will come back to you in a minute on those. Now, Torsten, please, your turn. And if you could, Eduardo, also take the slides now out, please. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you very much, um, Elena. Um, very happy to uh, uh, be part of this uh, panel discussion today. Um, let me actually uh, do something rather unusual for myself. Um, it's the first time in 12 years uh, since you did introduce me as a member of the Advisory Scientific Com uh, Committee of the ESRB, the European Systemic Risk Board. I have to do something again, something rather unusual for me uh, and include a disclaimer. Um, as you pointed out, um, uh, I'm actually um, involved in the uh, emergency work of the ESRB as uh, chair of uh, one of the work streams on uh, payout restrictions. Um, I will not refer to this work uh, directly um, or indirectly, I will, of course. Um, let me just mention, of course, that anything I'm about to say here is uh, purely my own views and are not the views, not necessarily the views of the ESRB, the general board, its general board, or any of its uh, member institutions. Um, so that's um, number one. Uh, number my second um, uh, kind of introductory remark. I can hope I hope you can see now my uh, my slides. My second introductory remark is that um, I will pick up on a couple of themes uh, by Edouard, but will of course also set kind of a, a certain uh, emphasis. And uh, maybe the 
first point I want to make. Oh, sorry, yes, here we go. Um, what uh, um, uh, Edouard already mentioned, so unlike in the 2008 uh, crisis, uh, this crisis did not start in the financial sector, but the financial sector will not only be affected, probably even more than uh, other sectors in the economy, but it also has a very critical role, um, including during the uh, recovery phase that we hopefully get into pretty soon. Um, I would also like to kind of join what, uh, um, or confirm what uh, Edouard has said in the sense that um, I think the, the very quick reaction of uh, both monetary uh, and prudential uh, policy authorities clearly show a much better preparation today than they did uh, 12 years ago. And I think uh, we also have to uh, acknowledge that the uh, regulatory reforms, including the counter-cyclical capital buffer, the conservation uh, capital buffer, uh, have been really useful. Um, of course, uh, um, uh, I was uh, a bit dis, uh, uh, dismayed to find out that many of the Euro area countries have actually currently zero counter-cyclical capital buffers who could not uh, uh, release them. Um, now, the other issue, of course, is we want the bank to be as strong as possible to go through the crisis, support the economy, um, and avoid what would be kind of the worst case scenario that, uh, as in 2008, this, uh, an economic crisis will be followed by a financial crisis. Um, yes. So why is the banking system so important during the current uh, crisis? Um, well, it serves as a transmission channel for monetary fiscal policy actions. Uh, for example, the guarantee scheme, somebody already referred to this uh, in the chat. Uh, we want to keep lending, uh, uh, the lending flow going. Um, and of course, um, they also, on a very basic level, they serve as a transmission uh, channel for support payments by the government. Now, the one big challenge that we faced, and that's basically also on the basis, actually, at a fundament for many of the actions that SSM and other uh, supervisors have been taking, is that bank lending is by its nature pro-cyclical due to the information asymmetries, due to uh, pro-cyclicality in the, in the collateral values, and also, of course, because of the very high uncertainty that we are currently uh, facing. Um, then there's also, of course, a regulatory ele element, um, losses uh, um, increase, risk rates go down, and that will reduce capital, and then, of course, uh, might lead to deleveraging, as we've seen it in 2008-9, uh, that's exactly what we want to avoid, especially with this kind of uh, uh, crisis. Now, as um, already, um, uh, Edouard already mentioned, I'm not going to go through all the details. Let me just add to, in addition to the capital relief done by the SSM, many national authorities where it was available also released the counter-cyclical capital buffer, which in the uh, EU is on the national level and not on the on the banking uh, uh, union level. On the global level, there was also a moratorium on the implementation of further regulatory reforms under Basel III. Um, other than that, since this question came up in the chat, um, I'm afraid there wasn't uh, much international cooperation um, as far as I understand. Um, uh, neither on the technical level in, in Basel, at least not as much as we would like to have hoped for, and definitely not on the political level, uh, the, the G20 level, which is kind of unfortunate, um, but that's where we stand. So I think for the moment, we really have to concentrate uh, on what we can do uh, in the European Union. Now, in addition, and uh, Edouard already um, uh, alluded to that, and I want to talk a bit more about that, um, in late March, early April, not just the uh, SSM, I, I we mark here as uh, an audit here as ECB, um, as being part of the ECB, uh, but also the European Banking Authority and the uh, Insurance Authority, IOPA, uh, and following that, many national authorities, including the Bank of England, um, have encouraged banks and also insurance companies to restrain from voluntary payouts, including dividend payments, and in some cases also uh, share buybacks. Again, the idea being we want to protect the capital base, um, we want to um, minimize the effect of the pro-cyclicality of bank lending. Um, and um, of course, if you're on the one hand, you have capital relief. If on the one hand, you have national government supporting the real economy through payments, guarantee schemes, which indirectly also benefits the, uh, 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 the banking system, um, you don't want the banks to turn around and pay um, dividends, buy back shares, or maybe also pay uh, bonuses uh, um, to their material risk takers. So that's um, um, uh, kind of behind this um, uh, this uh, this um, this recommendation of the ECB and other institutions to uh, 
uh, hold back on, uh, uh, on these uh, payouts. Of course, it's also um, to avoid a stigma effect. If you have individual banks uh, basically deciding not to pay out dividends, then they will be punished by the market. Whereas if you have a widespread, broad restrictions on all the banks, um, basically the effect uh, is uh, much smaller. And actually in looking into the data, we actually found, find exactly that. Now you could argue, on the other hand, um, investor rights, investor protection, um, investor relationships going forward. Maybe banks, they will have to go back to the market to uh, raise additional funding. Well, if you stop, paying, uh, if you stop them from paying uh, dividends, um, that might actually be a kind of a negative signal to the market. Um, again, you could, um, and you could finally also say maybe there's a reallocation function of, uh, through uh, dividend payments uh, or buy, share buybacks. Well, all of these arguments are valid ones. Um, I guess the financial stability argument currently weighs much stronger. But of course, these arguments also show that um, this, uh, we are really talking about temporary restrictions, not permanent restrictions. By the way, there is a big difference, again, since this was brought up, between the European Union and especially the US, but also other countries. Uh, the US uh, has not taken any steps uh, in, this, uh, in this direction, as far as I know, um, um, basically arguing that the, the capital buffers in the US are, are much stronger and is currently uh, not needed. Well, there's one additional element I want to briefly talk about. Um, and that is the single market. Um, if you talk about um, restrictions, for example, on payouts, um, this would primarily, we would argue, apply on the consolidated level because the single market principle of free capital should not include or should as counter to the idea that there should be uh, uh, restrictions on the sub-consolidated level, meaning on the uh, national levels. So I'm talking, for example, about the subsidiaries of Italian banks in uh, countries like Slovenia or in Croatia, for example. Um, now, we've seen, although, uh, we've seen that some Central and Eastern European countries actually have imposed restrictions, at least dividend suspension on the subconsolidated level, with actually some very strong arguments um, in the sense that um, uh, many of the support policies of which, uh, from which banks also um, benefit are on the national level, not on the EU level. And of course, the fact that there is no perfect risk sharing. Um, and of course, there is still this uh, historic uh, ghost uh, around uh, of 2008 9 when there was uh, uh, capital outflows, heavy capital outflows from Central Eastern Europe back to the parent banks. And of course, this is to be avoided this time around. Um, on the other hand, there is, of course, the risk that we go back to broader regulatory ring fencing, as we've seen in, uh, also including between Italy and Germany, for example in, uh, I think, 2010-11. So I think a, a strong dialogue is needed here between all involved parties. I, I was very happy to find out that the Vienna Initiative still exists um, and can actually pick up some of these uh, discussions uh, between countries and also financial institutions. By the way, this is a much broader uh, topic, not just within the EU, but also for generally for the developing emerging world, given the importance of cross-border banking um, across many regions. Uh, in the world. Now, I want to briefly look forward. I think that's actually my last uh, content slide, if I recollect correctly. Um, well, all the capital relief in the world, all the changes in provisioning standards will not prevent losses. So eventually, we will have a, 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 a strong look at the bank's balance sheets um, and find out that they will be under uh, capitalized. There have to be exit strategy, as somebody pointed out in the chat, uh, from these capital relief measures. So what are we going to do? We also know that uh, the idea that we're going to have a V-shaped uh, recovery is uh, probably for the dreams. Um, it will be much longer. There will be also a very uneven recovery across different sectors and also um, different uh, uh, countries, which also implies that losses might actually vary a lot um, across uh, uh, countries and also across banks, depending on their uh, the industrial focus. Um, further, um, European banks have already come under pressure for different reasons, um, and actually Elena and I discussed this uh, just recently in another conference. Um, interest rates will definitely stay very low for much longer now, which has been one uh, source of uh, losses for banks. And there will be also stronger competition from big tech companies, which probably will come out very well from this crisis. Um, so how do we deal with that? And I think I'm not saying that this is something to uh, consider immediately, but it's something to look ahead to. We have the BRRD, we have the Bank Resolution Framework, which, as I would argue, actually, from my observation, has worked relatively well in the case of several idiosyncratic bank failures. 
However, I would strongly argue, and I have some research to back this up, that this will not work during systemic crisis. Partly because it is bank resolution frameworks are not for systemic crisis, partly because we have an incomplete uh, a banking union. So yes, we might need uh, bank re uh, recapitalization. Um, it cannot be on the national level for the same reason that recovery funds cannot be purely on the national level because it's beyond the fiscal space of some member countries. So it has to be really on the EU and uh, uh, Euro area level, including ideas such as a uh, bad bank, uh, for example. Let me summarize. Um, so again, COVID-19 crisis did not start in the financial sector, but we really, um, and even though uh, some people argue we shouldn't talk about finance at all during this health crisis, I think uh, the financial sector will be critical in determining how this crisis will play out and how we will come out of this crisis. The initial reactions have been, I would say, as an outside observer, excellent, very welcome. There's little, uh, I mean, I, I kept, um, in, uh, journalists keep pressing me to, to criticize them. I haven't found much to criticize, honestly. Um, however, I think the hard work is really still ahead, um, including in the financial sector. I think we will need uh, bank recapitalization, maybe future span, not talk about bailouts because it's such an ugly word, all right? Um, what you have to do is address the question of uh, state aid for firms that are not that are headquartered in tax havens. That's not really for banks, that's for non-banks more, I guess. Uh, we have to talk about transfer payments across countries, and we have to talk also about how to finance this ultimately uh, in terms of uh, income and wealth taxation. Let me make a very final point here, and I'm kind of um, moving away a bit from supervision now, and that is um, uh, I've the, there was this uh, court decision, constitutional court decision in Karlsruhe in Germany uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, kind of criticizing and questioning the monetary financing uh, actions by the ECB. Um, like many economists, I was uh, um, uh, dismayed by this uh, decision. Um, however, there was maybe a positive side effect in the sense that it put pressure on the fiscal authorities, including two of the core countries, especially Germany, to kind of uh, step up to the plate and say, well, these decisions on recovery funds, these decisions, including what we will see in the banking sector, will have to be taken by politicians. They cannot be purely taken by uh, regulators by technocrats because they have to be democratically uh, legitimized. They have to be done ultimately by people accountable, by um, a level accountable directly to the people. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thorsten, for the many uh, issues that you touch upon. So despite not having, as you said, international cooperation much so far, we thought it would instead be very important to have an outside view outside of the Euro area and possibly the European Union. So till we thought you would be an ideal person to give us this outside view. So please, the floor is yours. But please try to stick to the seven minutes if possible. Yes, indeed. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, very good. Thank you very much, Eliam, for both for organizing this event and for inviting me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. So um, the response to the crisis has been swift, it's been broad-based, and it's really been massive. Uh, and the approaches of, on the two sides of the Atlantic have been really quite different um, uh, in, some, in some important ways. And how you respond to the crisis is going to depends really <clears throat> on what you believe both about the duration of the crisis and whether you think that the state of the world AC or after the crisis is going to be quite different uh, or quite similar to before the crisis. So if you think this is going to be a short duration event, and uh, if AC is largely the same as BC, then uh, you're going to expect a quick recovery. There's going to be a strong motivation to keep employees in place <clears throat> to preserve uh, those important employer-employee relationships that are hard to rebuild quickly. You want to finance this problem through the employers as opposed to through unemployment insurance. You're going to worry mostly about liquidity concerns as opposed to solvency concerns. And therefore, you're going to, you want to do a lot in order to avoid bankruptcy, <clears throat> which will be just collateral, uh, sort of unnecessary collateral damage from the short duration, more liquidity-oriented uh, uh, disruption. Uh, than it is if you think it's going to be both more long duration uh, and that the world after COVID is going to be quite different. <clears throat> In that world, um, uh, you're going to worry a lot more about solvency concerns. You want to provide flexibility to the labor market uh, for the sort of inevitable restructuring. 
and you want to make it easy to do quick uh, and large-scale restructuring if you're going to expect a lot of uh, bankruptcies. And that difference is very is really quite vivid in the labor market. Um, uh, <clears throat> if, if you compare, I have two examples here: the UK and Germany. What their unemployment rate? What has happened to their unemployment rate in, uh, from February to April to to the U.S.? The difference is really stark. Now, this matters for our problem here about thinking about banks and the role of banks, because if it's a short duration problem, this is much better suited for debt financing where the banks can play, of course, a very important role. Whereas if you think this is gonna be a longer problem and a more structural problem, that's really much more better suited for equity financing. And the banks, and importantly also the central banks, um, are gonna, it's less obvious how, what role they're gonna play in this. So just, you know, I want to sort of set the stage with those two differences. Um, <clears throat> now, um, how resilient are the banks, actually? This has been the, the discussion that Edouard and, uh, Edouard and uh, Thorsten, I think, it sort of laid out very nicely. So we're going from the great financial crisis to the great pandemic crisis. <clears throat> banks, of course, have increased their self-insurance against these shocks quite dramatically with more capital and more liquidity. And I think what's e at least equally important is that the risk management capabilities have improved quite dramatically. For better risk identification and vulnerability assessment, better data, better systems, better controls like model risk management, formal model risk management, but also um, cyber risk management. We've noticed a significant increase in cyber attacks in the last two to three months, and all that practice and all that work has become is, pay is paying off. Now, uh, we have been, in fact, practicing a lot for a crisis, if not exactly this crisis, uh, through the stress testing process. Edward, uh, I think, also mentioned this. Um, and um, uh, the approach, again, has been a little different across the two sides of the Atlantic. Um, on your side of the pond, the stress testing exercises uh, that happened, you know, for good or for ill fortune, right in the middle of this. Um, and then you've had pause, whereas the Federal Reserve has continued the exercise here in the U.S. Um, they're essentially taking this, you know, as a as a, as an opportunity to watch what's what's been done in vitro uh, to seeing what's actually now happening uh, live in vivo. <clears throat> so, um, what? How is this unfolding? How well prepared are or do we think the banks are? And this is we're still very early in this crisis, uh, and the losses are going to take a little while to manifest. Um, I think so far the banks uh, are actually holding up quite well. Uh, last week there's an EBA estimate that um, uh, the largest 117 banks in the EU could suffer about 315 billion euros in losses due to COVID, um, and that's based on uh, previous stress test results. Um, where 48 banks uh, back in 2018 was, uh, uh, were projected to have losses of about 534 billion euros. Uh, there's a similar ex sort of um, uh, extent of damage, if you will, that we know that banks can survive in the U.S. from last year's stress test, the results of which we already know. Uh, the run from this year we'll know in about a month. Um, in real life, though, as banks are <coughs> managing this in, in you know, literally in real time, you'd think that this stress testing machinery that they've built up is incredibly useful. Uh, it has been useful to some degree uh, in, in updating it, uh, you know, on an almost week by week basis, but the machinery is pretty unwieldy uh, and there's a real premium in the middle of a crisis for speed. Uh, and so in that sense, it's been a little disappointing uh, how difficult it has been for banks to just take that machinery that they've spent so much time and effort developing and just plugging it into this crisis. Now, <clears throat> let me leave you um, uh, with just one further, because I want to dig into this a little bit further before ending my comments. Um, <clears throat> And I want to hear, I'm going to just uh, draw on the U.S. experience. I want to have, I have a couple of, um, on this chart, I have a couple of lines that I want to just explain. So first is the red line is the GDP path. This is real GDP <coughs> indexed to, uh, if you will, uh, the beginning of the, very beginning of the crisis. Um, the, the experience and real GDP path in the financial crisis is given by the red line. <coughs> and so this is about a two-year horizon that we have here. And even after two years from the beginning of the crisis, we still had not, in the U.S. at least, returned to pre-crisis pre GDP levels. The uh, solid, the thick blue line is the current uh, projection, the consensus projection of uh, the U.S. economy uh, from now until the end of 2021. 
Uh, and we can see clearly here that the consensus is that we don't expect the U.S. economy to recover uh, until the early 2022. Now, this is still looking B-ish uh, in terms of recovery. I'm a little skeptical that it's going to be that, that nice and B-ish, but uh, it is a gentle B because we're only getting, the projection is that we'll, it's going to take us about two years to get out. And there are two other lines on this, <clears throat> and they are the stress scenario <clears throat> from last year's and this year's uh, uh, stress test exercise. And I think what matters here for this uh, comparison is <clears throat> that the, uh, the stress, the scenario that the banks have stress tested against, and the profile is, is similar in Europe, um, is still uh, more uh, dramatic. The cumulative GDP loss under those scenarios is still larger than the projected cumulative GDP loss um, uh, that we're currently experiencing. Uh, even though the shape is very different. So um, we've, we stress test against a different scenario, but it's naive to think that you can actually guess what the actual scenario is going to look like. So the whole point of all of this that we're experiencing is you build resistance against a severe shock in the financial markets and the real economy. Reality may turn out a little different, but the point is, is that you've done a lot to actually become resilient against a broad set of stresses. Um, and, and a set of damage uh, to prepare yourself uh, for those eventualities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. In the meantime, I think we have lost uh, Torsten, but nevertheless, let's uh, go on and uh, hopefully he will join soon. So let me give the microphone back to you, Eduard. But let me add, in addition to some of the things, I mean, to, to the discussion that we have had from the other two speakers, let me add some questions that uh, you may have seen already in the Q&A. And let me group them a little bit. So there is a group of questions about the relaxation of buffers. And the question is, how can we make sure that banks will actually use the buffers? We have seen some banks doing it, some banks not doing it. But in general, whereas, I mean, it is true that you want to induce banks to use this buffer, banks are very concerned in using the buffer also because the market, the market can see uh, the use of this buffer not so positively. In line with this, though, given that banks are also behaving differently, how are we reading our capital ration across banks? I mean, does this different behavior change the, if you want, the reliance that we have on uh, when we read the balance sheet and when we are told how much capital the banks have. Um, second, related to that, so, no, so this is the fifth. How do we make sure that the buffers are actually used and that the banks don't fear in a way the stigma problem coming from the market? The second big uh, bulk of question is about dividend. We have already heard uh, uh, Thorsten talking long about the dividends. But there is a question that I would like to ask you directly from the chat box because it's very clear. How do you balance the desire to encourage banks to be prudent in their capital distribution going forward with the need to ensure that the equity investors continue to invest in European banks, contributing to their ability to be competitive with American and Asian banks for inter alia capital and talent? So I think this is one of the core questions how can we deal with this trade-off between on the one hand, they want to be put, and on the other hand, still have European banks that remain attractive. Third bank of question is about non-performing loans. When are we going to see non-performing loans coming up on the balance sheet of banks? And eventually, can we start already thinking or discussing of having a sort of European uh, part of European banks that is going to manage the non-performing loans coming up during the COVID crisis. Microphone is yours. I'm afraid you are still mute. Try? No? Um, yes. Said so. that. Yeah, because I was saying I was mute by you, so. <laughs> uh, um, but then, uh, can you hear me now? This is fine. I hope it's better. I have changed the headphones to, uh, to do that. Um, uh, so uh, let's go to the substance. Use of the buffers. This is why we keep publicly 
and also more than publicly, privately, encouraging the use of the buffers. But uh, we cannot tell the markets the reactions. And what we see is that there is a very big, uh, I will say, um, fear of being the first to use the buffers, to be, to be clear. There's, the, there's the, the outlier stigma that is there. Uh, so uh, I, I think it, it's there, so we will, we will see if uh, there is further need to use the buffers, because of course, I, even if I am supervisor, I cannot rule out the optimistic view that maybe they will not need to use it. But if there is further need to, uh, to use of the buffers, uh, we will have to try to see how we can solve this uh, collective action problem. And this collective action problem will need a collective coordination that may need, for instance, maybe a change of regulation. That's a way to try to resolve co uh, collective actions. Or a concerted, uh, the possibility to have a concerted action with, uh, uh, with uh, the main players. This, this has happened, uh, for instance, uh, it happened in the US for the dividends buybacks. Huh? I mean, you, uh, to go back to your second question in dividends, it's true that the US did not uh, make a recommendation on dividends, but they did gather uh, the, all the, uh, the most important US banks to uh, um, convince them not to do uh, the share buybacks. And just to give you an order of magnitude, the distribution of capital is 75% buybacks in the US uh, in relation to 25%. So there may be, there has been a difference between the US and the EU, but it's a difference of 25%, not a, uh, not a difference of 100%. Uh, so that leads me also to, um, to your second question. Of course, we have to balance. Of course, to have to balance. Uh, at some point, we thought it was useful that we in Europe uh, took a measure that we, th uh, that we thought was right. And I really think this measure was right. To prolong it, we will see. Uh, we will always balance. But again, one of the things that is uh, that I will also uh, underline to you is that we said we stop the dividends. We will not stop 81 payments. And so 81 issuance are there. They are still on the market today. So that's why also wait to try to uh, strike a balance in Europe. So uh, again, we are not dogmatic. We know it is a trade-off. It's not normal not to pay dividends. Uh, it's just a, a very last resort situation. Not not because the, the banks were bad, but, uh, because the, that would be a necessity then not to pay dividends, but to care for an enormous amount of uncertainty. So we, we will be monitoring very closely what is, how this uncertainty evolves in order to strike the right balance. And so I cannot rule out that we change. I cannot rule out that we stay. Uh, uh, really, uh, uh, today, uh, this is the only, uh, the only thing that we can, uh, that will be proportionate to the amount of uncertainty uh, that we have today is that we will be constantly monitoring the situation to see if we have to strike a different balance, but we certainly cannot commit ourselves hmm, today to, to exactly what will be uh, the path for the future. On the NPLs, when they will be coming up? Okay, normally they will be, uh, of course, there will be uh, an effect of uh, um, lag. All in, a, in all crises, NPL have a lag with the crisis, huh, with the triggering of the crisis. Here, the, the lag will be even more because one of the massive things that have been done uh, in response to the crisis have been moratoria. So by definition, this moratoria that can still, by the way, be prolonged, will have an effect of uh, uh, slowing the creation of NPLs. Uh, so this is also something that we are uh, looking at. We are looking at the uh, different moratoria. By the way, uh, uh, they are very different huh, from country to country, which from a European point of view is not so welcome, but uh, this is how life it is today. So uh, we have to, uh, to monitor that. Uh, but what we can say is that we will see it progressively. And I expect that the, uh, there will be also balance to be have be between um, furthering the moratoria, 
which is uh, something that is event, and getting out slowly of the moratorium also. So here again, I, we are completely conscious of the question. We are monitoring it. The truth is I cannot commit what will be exactly the path out. We, we know there is a question about the path and we have to smooth uh, the path out uh, for the NPLs because we don't want from a quarter to another to see a doubling of NPLs in Europe. That will be very, very bad. Uh, there are different uh, uh, ways to, to do that. Some are in our hands, some are not in our hands, uh, like the government moratoria, uh, but uh, be sure that we will adapt. I cannot say more today, uh, but we are pretty conscious that we need to have a way out that is uh, that will not uh, uh, kill the recovery as soon as uh, as it begins. Uh, that, that's very clear. Yeah? Uh, again, here, uh, the role of the banking sector will be even more important for the recovery, I would say. Be sure that the recovery really goes up and, and does not stall immediately. Uh, so about uh, a European anti uh, an European uh, uh, asset management company, you know uh, that this is an idea. This is an idea that does does not depend on ECB because uh, uh, this will be to distribute uh, uh, to distribute uh, in fact uh, government aid. To be clear, so we are always ready to concur to uh, interesting ideas, but we have to see whether. Whether there is room for it, hmm? whether there is room for it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe just now a question for Thorsten that was raised up. What's your opinion on the Commission temporary framework in uh, response to state aid? So what's your view on the relaxation of the state aid? Was that necessary? Is that well done? Does it uh, hinder the single market? How do you see it? Um, well, the, the, the temporary relations, uh, relaxation of the, the, the state aid was certainly uh, necessary, I would argue, um, uh, just simply for the fact that uh, during these uh, unprecedented times, um, uh, the state, the government serves as the kind of uh, insurer of last resorts. So this kind of need, uh, this kind of aid was needed, and it was um, um, kind of not surprising, uh, and I think very necessary that this uh, state aid uh, uh, suspension, I would call it, um, has been uh, has been agreed upon. Um, of course, this uh, ultimately, and yes, it does in, it does uh, in, include a certain element of uh, potentially unlevel playing field because, as we know, some countries have much more fiscal space than others and can therefore also uh, throw much more money at the problem than other countries. Um, and I think that's also one of the reasons why we need this European Recovery Fund, as being proposed by uh, uh, Monsieur Macron and. Uh, um, Madame Merkel, and of course also by uh, Ursula von der Leyen for the European Commission, um, to exactly address this issue of, uh, of uh, unlevel playing field uh, consequences of the state aid suspension. And of course, we might also see in the future um, uh, that as in 2008-9, um, there might be conditionality being imposed afterwards. We've seen this in, uh, during the global financial crisis. Um, and of course, some countries, and I'm not sure where the uh, European Commission exactly stands, I think the European Commission stands on this actually as well, if I know, we collect correctly that any uh, company that receives state aid cannot uh, pay out uh, dividends at this stage, which is of course uh, something almost too obvious to to, to state. Uh, but again, it's very similar to the situation in the banking sector, right? You give capital relief, um, you indirectly support banks uh, uh, through these uh, support programs for uh, households and uh, and uh, uh, and firms. There's absolutely no way that these banks can start uh, paying out dividends at this time. I mean, this would be just it would be effectively wealth transfer. Uh, from the uh, from taxpayer to uh, to shareholders and potentially also senior management if you talk about bonuses. Can I maybe just very briefly uh, pick up on one topic that has come up um, uh, also for Edouard. On, um, the, the capital relief has um, uh, has not really led to this uh, increase in lending as we would like to see it. And I think that's a, a, a general problem with macro prudential tools like this one, right? We kind of know how to use macro prudential tools in a tightening phase. Um, to kind of, you know, have uh, debt to income uh, ratios, um, uh, loan to value uh, restrictions, um, but we don't really know how to use regulatory tools um, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, foster uh, lending during these crises. Um, and I guess that's where the, uh, the link to the other tool comes in, uh, in terms of the fiscal policy, uh, which is the guarantee schemes that have been uh, adopted uh, across uh, uh, many countries. 
um, and which ultimately in the, in the, in the extreme case as 100% uh, uh, guarantees, uh, basically turn banks into utilities where they just pass on uh, uh, funding from the government uh, to, the, to the borrowers on their balance sheet, but ultimately with the guarantee of the government. Uh, something that's again in the survival mode in which we are right now, something very useful. In the longer run, of course, uh, you have to ultimately, you have to move away from that. Um, and um, uh, when you get to the uh, recovery and then also to the reallocation phase of the crisis, um, uh, that's when, of course, um, uh, um, the, there has to be an exit strategy for that. Thanks. Okay, Till, let me turn to you. With the first, I would like to go back to this dividend story, given that you see it from the US perspective, with the following question. I mean, I understand fully from the world that we, we don't know where we are living yet. So in a way, we can't predict what's going to happen and there will always be a trade-off between these two things. On the one, the market attraction, if you want, and the other one is the sound and prudent behavior and the solvency of banks at the moment. But of course, uh, this can vary geographically, time-wise, meaning maybe we are, going in, we are going to be in October, where the Europe will be still behind and the US will have recovered. Let's assume this. So if that's the case, then how can we sort of solve this? Because then Europe will remain more conservative, probably, on the dividend side, and um, the US instead will relax again. So to which extent, and then of course, given that there is one international capital market, this is a problem. So to which extent, and this goes back to one of the initial questions actually in the Q&A box, to which extent we may need international coordination and would it be correct to have international coordination on this particular issue? Because the two economies maybe just do different, they're just performing differently at that stage. Uh, thank you for that. So, um... Uh, I think first, I, you know, Edward made a, an important observation, which is that uh, the bulk of the kind of capital return to shareholders in the U.S. banks has come from the share repurchases, not from uh, not from the dividends. Uh, you know, he cited seventy five percent. That's uh, uh, that's right for the banking system for as a whole for the largest banks. Amongst the GSIPs, it's actually even closer to eighty percent. So um, uh, turning that part off. Uh, has uh, already stemmed, you know, the largest outflow of capital uh, that is available. Unfortunately, Euro European banks haven't been uh, sufficiently profitable in the post-financial crisis world to allow them to have um, a, a significant cherry purchase program. So all the capital exit has been really through dividends. Um, it's hard for me to say, you know, what degree of uh, how international cooperation on this particular narrow issue is going to, would, uh, would help. Um, I think you'd have to believe that the U.S. banks would, have, would be expected to play a significant role in European, um, you know, um, um, I guess, uh, credit supply. Um, if, if the increased uh, capital from U.S. banks uh, would be helpful uh, in the face of, European banks not being able to provide the same amount of, uh, amount of credit because they have uh, smaller capital cushions. That has to be a prerequisite because otherwise, why would you we'd be talking about the dividend story to begin with? Um, I want to just very closely relate it, come back to a point that both uh, Torsten and Edward made, which is, uh, you know, on, on the buffers, so still the use of the, the capital. I think we have to be very precise here, and I think Torsten was, was going in that direction. So what do, you know, how could we tell that in fact they're using the capital buffers? And we could tell by looking at their credit supply. So in other words, looking at their balance sheet. And they're actually, you know, the, the evidence has been a bit mixed and a little different across the, uh, across the two sides of the Atlantic. Uh, in, um, in both sides, there have been drawdowns from loan commitments. And you can sort of think about this as, in, you can somewhat think about this as involuntary credit supply because they are, have already committed to having these, uh, these credits. And that's a very important, a kind of an automatic stabilizer actually, where um, uh, in the face of an immediate shock, firms, borrowers can immediately draw down that credit in a kind of precautionary liquidity provision that they have. So that has happened on both sides of the Atlantic, not sufficiently close to the data in Europe to know how much, if it's larger in the US, I think it's a little larger, but so far, I think for me, that's the clearest evidence that buffers are actually being used, that banks are making, you know, are not yet sufficiently in, uh, uh, in 
credit constraint mode that they would curtail the drawdowns uh, that they have already committed to to uh, to borrowers. So I think so far so so far so good. Of course, the we, we, the losses haven't by and large materialized yet, uh, and I think this is what everyone is worried about. Will this you know uh, allowance of a balance sheet uh, increase uh, continue? We don't know, but I think so far it's worked exactly as planned. Okay, Eduardo, of course, you may feel uh, free to come back to these issues, but let me also ask you uh, some other questions that have been asked through the Q&A box. One relates to other risks. So we have been talking now here mostly about credit risk, but and, and a little bit about market risk. But of course, there are new risks. I mean, there are risks that were already there, but they may be exacerbated in this situation. The two most important probably are ICT and anti-money laundering. So what's the view of the SSM on those risks? So on um, ICT, of course, this was, uh, and I will say uh, even more at the beginning uh, because of the, uh, the unprecedented operational situation of the banks that uh, made them rely much more even on, on distance uh, uh, infrastructure and that, that was really one of a key operating things, operating issues at the, I would say immediately after the beginning of the lockdown. So in March, we, now I think with some weeks of, um, of experience, we saw, of course, um, more or less at the time of the lock, uh, lockdown, uh, a great increase in the number of attacks that the banks suffered. But, uh, and again, uh, I am prudent, so I will never say that the future will go as a present, but for the time being, uh, they were not more acute. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the impact of these attacks has not been uh, considerable different uh, to what it is. So we still are in, of course, a very enhanced uh, monitoring mode for the reporting of the attacks and the follow-ups of that. For the time being, we we do not have evidence. Uh, again, uh, let's not uh, speak uh, too much about the future, but we do not have evidence that uh, uh, what has been the upgrading for the, the last uh, times, and it, this remains a priority for the SSM, uh, the upgrading of the resilience mechanism in uh, for uh, the, the technologies, the IC uh, technologies, uh, has been suffering. So I will not say that this has caught the, the banks unprepared. And I would rather say that it is, uh, it has been a, a rather good outcome huh? because we saw uh, again much more attacks than uh, than was ordinary. On AML, uh, maybe you saw it was uh, of course less um, prominent than or measures, but uh, there was a communique by EBA, which is now uh, leading uh, uh, the increased convergence uh, uh, work in the European Union on AML uh, that. Uh, uh, raise the awareness of uh, the, the parties that there was no relaxation about AML risk. Uh, there was no relaxation of the, of the AML framework. In, in fact, we will maybe a bit delayed because of the crisis, but we are in the process of trying to construct and reinforce the European dimension of the AML framework. And uh, the ECB is very much in favor of this enhanced Europeanization of the AML framework. Uh, I think we, we long to have uh, uh, an AML counterpart uh, uh, that is more strong at the European level because we think that will increase the efficiency. We have invested a lot in, uh, uh, since the last year, uh, maybe you noticed that we had a, a framework agreement that was made at the beginning of the last year in, in um, January uh, that was signed between uh, the EC and fifth, more than 50 anti-money laundering authorities in Europe, eh? because we are 27 countries, but more than 50 AML authorities uh, because of the, the dispersion at the national level uh, of their competences. So we have been increasing a lot already our interaction with the anti-money laundering authorities. We hope that already Again, in anti-money laundering, like in other things, you see the risk materialize afterwards. Eh? Uh, so we 
we are still, I will say, under the spell of the weaknesses that have been spot for anti-money laundering in Europe, I would say, in the past five years. I hope really that since last year we, we are... Uh, we are improving and clearly ECB will support it. Uh, on the other side, ECB is not an anti-money laundering authority, so we are in a supporting mode rather than in the forefront of this evolution. Okay, thank you. Thorsten, back to you with a short question. Uh, still on this international cooperation a little bit, or at least on the heterogeneous reaction across countries and behavior, both of authorities and banks. Do you think this is going to somehow hinder Basel going forward? I mean, does it, does it mean that we should expect somehow a weakening of the Basel committee role? Uh, I'm afraid so, but it's not only that. I mean, uh, there have been now, um, there are, well, there have been, uh, I think, um, decisions by the Federal Reserve, uh, but also attempts by the European Commission to kind of uh, undermine the idea of the leverage ratio, if I understand correctly. So I'm not quite sure about the details in, uh, in the US, but um, there are plans, as far as I understand, in Brussels to kind of take out uh, sovereign bonds uh, from the calculation of the leverage ratio. I think that would be uh, just uh, the absolutely wrong uh, signal. Um, so I'm, yes, I, I, there is a risk that um, out of this crisis, out of different divergent uh, uh, policy responses, but of course also more generally, given the, the current political environment, current po global political environment, um, there is kind of a, um, um, maybe not a complete breakdown, but uh, a bit of more of a divergence uh, and uh, less cooperation going on uh, in, the, uh, in the international regulatory uh, uh, framework, I'm afraid, yes. Till, for you instead, what, how shall we think going forward of, uh, of internal models and in particular on the usual ways which we have think about internal models? So what are the PD going to tell us going forward? Can we trust them in the same way as we used to do, given that this big, if you want, uh, um, structural break that we are seeing now and the uncertainty of what uh, past PDs can tell us about the future? How shall we think about them? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I mean, this is uh, not not uh, <clears throat> not unrelated to any of the models that we use to do projections, whether they're stress test models or they're uh, sort of internal models for regulatory capital purposes. Um, uh, uh, I, you know, I I am quite skeptical that um, they are going that they, they are proving to be robust uh, to what uh, seems to be some kind of a structural break. Uh, we don't know if it's a temporary, you know, sort of a temp, a short, short-lived uh, uh, break, or if it's really a much more uh, long-term, uh, more fundamental break. But a break, nonetheless, it is. Uh, and um, uh, to, you know, take those models blindly without a lot of skepticism, I think, would be very, uh, very worrisome and quite dangerous. And uh, in that sense, I'm relieved that you know, the sort of the discipline of formal model risk management has, has sort of set in, at least in the, in the largest banks, if nothing else, but that there is a formal mechanism inside banks to review regularly, um, you know, the robustness and continued performance uh, of the models. There's a lot more awareness of this than there was uh, 12 years ago. Um, but we'll, we'll see, we'll see if, if that skepticism essentially is a is going to be applied uh, because I think it's, we do need to be quite skeptical of the forward performance of these models. Following on this, and maybe we should uh, fast close because it's uh, now time, but maybe the last question to Eduard. So based on what Till has just said, what do you think is going to be maybe the main challenge going forward in supervision? More on a longer term, so not just the immediate uh, concern of these relaxations uh, and other things we've been talking about. Well, I will say we have uh, three major concerns. One of them is specifically European, and I will go back to what uh, uh, Thorsten Till said. Uh, we have a structural challenge of the profitability of the banking system in Europe that is uh, different from the situation in other parts of the world. So here, really, how to face that? Uh, it's uh, it's clearly the medium ter term challenge that we uh, that we have in Europe that it's specific for us. But of course, we share with all the banking system two, two other very important challenges, which is the uh, adaptation to uh, uh, 
uh, now it's uh, it's too much to say the, the new normal but how how will be the um, uh, the structural financial uh, landscape uh, after the shock of digitalization and clearly here the this crisis will serve as a catalyst for it so it's even more urgent that uh, this uh, 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 this issue of digitalization which is linked to the ict risk that you you mentioned today uh, also uh, should be even more prominent in the transformation of the banks yeah and the the third one which i think will be also very important i hope i do hope that one of the good things that may come out from this crisis is if um, I will say the uh, the social importance of bank lending comes reinforced. If they play a positive um, role in the recovery, I will say that this has the potential also with the challenges of uh, uh, the, the new climate change and, and transformation and the, the important need to transform the economy in uh, conducive to these social needs uh, to influence the, uh, the business models and the business places of the banks and they have to get out with an improved structural business model. Uh, uh, these two other challenges are really common to all the banks, digitalization and the transformation of the economy, uh, also in the perspective of uh, uh, climate change. These are global. But we do have this specific thing of being able to use this as leverages to also improve our structural profitability. Okay, maybe just on the final word from Thorsten and um, until on this, let me say, more positive message. So let's end with a more positive message, which is indeed digitalization and the social importance of bank lending. Can this help the banking sector going forward, in your view? Can this really be a game changer for banks? Well, um, it might be a game changer for banking and for financial services as such. Whether it's um, a game changer for uh, traditional banks, I'm not quite sure. So, um, as I mean, as you just pointed out, uh, also by Edouard, there um, uh, there will be more challenges ahead for for banks uh, uh, related to digitalization, to the the threat from uh, uh, the big techs, and of course, the I would add the, the the low interest rates. So, yes, it will be exciting times in terms of a transformation of the financial sector. But I think we also will see other players becoming. Uh, uh, getting a more important role. Um, but yes, there is, of course, um, I mean, if we want to end on an optimistic note, I think there will be positive sides also for customers. Um, so there might be actually also more competition and there might be more innovation coming about. And uh, maybe also on the positive side, we don't have to uh, uh, handle uh, cash as much anymore as before. Thanks. Till, so, will European banks catch up a little bit? I mean, following this discussion? Are you asking me about whether European banks will catch up? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I, I wanted to, I mean, I think Torsten made a really important point, which is that, you know, uh, that part of what the, what the, the move to digital, uh, if, if this crisis has not made it clear to all of us about how important that move is, I'm not sure what is going to make it clear, right? So um, it is, and I like the way Torsten just put it, this is a good move for banking. This is especially, I think, a good move for clients and customers of, of banking. Um, whether the established banks are going to be the ones who are going to benefit from it, um, that uh, is, is highly correlated with the degree to which they're embracing uh, this move to digital. I mean, we're, you know, we're seeing this in the U.S. and Europe. We're seeing this also, I think, uh, especially in Asia. Uh, it was remarkable to see the behavior, to change in customer behavior in China, for example, as, their, as the crisis unfolded there first about um, you know, how significant that shift is. And now that it's abating there more, how much that, how sticky that behavior uh, has been. So I think here in, in the US and Europe, we should take note of this. Uh, this change is here to stay. Okay, I'm afraid that we have reached the, our time. So we will have to close, but let me thank all of you. And uh, let me, let, let's uh, end with this positive note that maybe even the existing banks, given how fast they have, uh, they have adjusted to the new situation recently, I think they have implemented changes in two months that maybe they had planned in the next two years. 
let's say that even the incumbent, the current incumbent may, be, may benefit from it. Of course, Torsten is right, the others are even faster, but maybe there is a positive spillover and certainly for customers. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eduard, for sharing the views of the SSM with us. Good luck for the continuation of your work. You have big challenges in front of you. Thank you for being with us today and thank to Thorsten and Till for joining the discussion and to all the participants. Thank you. Bye-bye.